Good morning. Welcome to worship with the First Congregational Church of Great Barrington, United Church of Christ, on this beautiful and slightly warm summer day. We're so glad that you've taken the time to join us for worship, whether you're here in person or, or joining us at a later time uh, via YouTube. Nonetheless, we're glad that you're taking the time to unite your spirit with ours. A couple of really quick announcements before we begin our worship service this morning. Uh, the first is that now that we're back and, and things are starting to, to come to a new normal, um, we're, we're trying to keep you know some of our traditions alive. And so you've noticed that we've uh, tried to make sure we have fresh flowers each week for worship. Um, today we, we thank Deb Laramie for providing them in memory of her brother. But we'd also like to invite you to consider signing up to provide flowers as well. And the flower chart uh, has been moved. So if you look in the entrance way as you come in, right underneath the clock tower, there's now a flower chart on that bulletin board. And so we encourage you to um, take a look at the available dates and consider signing up to provide flowers. Also, um, immediately following the service today, uh, we invite you to join us outside in the courtyard for a story for all ages and a little treat. Uh, we've got some punch and some cookies uh, graciously given to us by uh, the Berkshire Box Society from their event last night um, that they've hoped we could make use of. And so I hope you join us for that. And, and you know, what's better than uh, a, a cookie and a story, really? Afterwards, you can go home for your nap. Uh, also this afternoon, uh, based on the survey that we uh, put out on our semi-annual meeting Sunday, uh, we were asking people, you know, things they'd be interested in, in order to help us build community with one another. And one of those was um, the idea of watching movies together. And so uh, after talking with a few folks and, and seeing what kind of interest people had, uh, we're going to go see a movie which is a great thing to do on a, on a hot day. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna meet here at the church at 3.20 to walk over to the triplex to see the 3.45 showing of In the Heights. Um, that's the musical um, Lin-Manuel Miranda um, had on Broadway, a big hit for a number of years, and it's finally um, made it into a movie. And so we'll go to see that. Um, for those who are interested, tickets are $8. Uh, once again, we'll meet here at the church at 320 and then walk over together for the movie. Um, it is rated PG-13 for those um, interested. Uh, last announcement is that um, our mission team is looking at ways of, of reaching beyond our walls and, and getting active and involved in the community. And so one of those ways that we're exploring this year is to partner with our friends in Sheffield to participate in the Appalachian Trail magic um, that they do there. And what this entails is uh, going for a day from, uh, we set up a little before 10 a.m. and you basically sit under a, a shelter in your lawn chairs, or they have some, uh, from about 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. and you wait for hikers to pass by in this field and there's a sign that goes out so they know to, to come into the field for, for snacks and things and then um, when they come you offer them a burger, a brat, uh, we fry it up special just for them. Uh, there's other uh, food and, and refreshments and different things to offer them and it's just a way of showing a little bit of hospitality to those hikers that are out on the trail. So uh, we do have a few people that will be doing that this Thursday. Uh, again, it's from 10 to 3 that we have to be on site. We get there a little bit earlier. Uh, we have room for at least two more. So if you're interested, please talk to Gary Williams or um, talk to me and I'll get you connected with Gary. Uh, we'd certainly love to have you. Uh, we've been told that sometimes it's really busy, sometimes it's a little slow. So, you know, feel free to bring a deck of cards or a book or, you know, if you're knitting or you would like to learn how to knit, I'll be there. I'll be happy to give knitting lessons while we wait for hikers. 
Uh, but it sounds like a great day of fun. So I hope you'll join us for that. With all of that then, let us prepare our hearts and minds with the call to worship. Wait for the Lord like those who hope in God's mercy. Watch for God like those who eagerly await the morning. Hear God's hopeful word like those who long for pardon. I invite you to join with me in a spirit of prayer. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Assure us, O God, that our hope is not in vain, that in those most desperate of times, you are there, ready to welcome us, to claim us, to love us. Be with us in this time of worship and go out with us into the world that we may share your love and your care for all people. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. I invite you now to uh, turn to the insert in your bulletin, Come Christians, join to sing. in this work of grace in the same way that you are the best in everything such as faith speech knowledge total commitment and the love we inspired in you I'm not giving an order 
but mentioning the commitment of others. I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes so that you could become rich through his poverty. I've given you my appointment about this, my opinion about this. It's not to your advantage to do this since you not only started to do it last year, but you wanted to do it too. Now finish the job as well, so that you finish it with much enthusiasm as you started, given what you can afford. A gift is appreciated because of what a person can afford, not because of what that person can't afford. If it's apparent that it's done willingly. It isn't that we want others to have financial ease and you financial difficulties, but it's a matter of equality. At the present moment, your surplus can fill their deficit, so that in the future, their surplus can fill your deficit. In this way, there is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered more didn't have too much, and the one who gathered less didn't have too little. Thank you, Don. Today's Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 to 43, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible translation. Jesus crossed the lake again, and on the other side a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, came forward. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him. My daughter is about to die. Please, come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A swarm of people were following Jesus, crowding in on him. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Don't you see the crowd pressing in against you? Yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully. To see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. Now, while Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house, saying to Jairus, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Just keep trusting. He didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, What's all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him, but he threw them all out. Then, taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went to the room where the child was. Taking her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, young woman, get up. 
Suddenly, the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what had happened. Then he told them to give her something to eat. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I know in our tradition, I talk and you stay quiet. I get that. I understand. That's how it normally works. But today I'm going to ask you to break the rules. Okay? Don't worry. Don't panic. Don't, don't think you have to run and pretend you need to use the restroom right now. Simple. How many of you have ever done a knock-knock joke? Do you know how knock-knock jokes work? Yes? I say knock-knock, you say who's there, etc., etc. Okay? So here's the thing. For my sermon to work today, and I'm assuming you would like my sermon to work today, I need you to work with me. I'm going to tell you a knock-knock joke, and I need you to respond, like, out loud. Can we do that? Humor me? Yes? Awesome. I knew you guys would do it. You're amazing. Knock-knock. Interrupting cow. Moo! Okay. I need to tell you that I was taught that joke by eight-year-olds, but I couldn't resist sharing it today. Because the truth is, nobody likes being interrupted. It reduces productivity. It's disrespectful. And while it's just, it's kind of rude. So I apologize for interrupting you. But in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is repeatedly interrupted. He's interrupted by his disciple Peter. He's interrupted by a leper. He's interrupted by a paralytic. He's interrupted by a blind beggar. And in today's reading, he's interrupted by an unnamed woman. Now, scholars of Mark will tell you that these are called Markan sandwiches. And no, you can't eat them. But what these interruptions are, are things worth paying attention to. These Markan sandwiches, these interruptions, create a disruption in the flow of the narrative. They make us stop and think about why it's happening. They're trying to draw our attention to something, something that's flowing underneath the surface of the story. Today's story is a prime example. Jesus has just returned from his trip across the, ro- the water, and he is immediately surrounded by these huge crowds They're all eager to see him, to touch him, to ask his help, to hear him teach. I mean, a superstar has come to town. And among them is Jairus. Jairus, who the text reminds us repeatedly, is a well-respected leader in the Jewish community. And he goes to Jesus and tells him that his 12-year-old daughter is sick. She's near death and begs Jesus to come and lay his hands on her so that she can be healed and live. Now, you know I have problems when when translations aren't good. And this is a problem in most English translations. The word in Greek there is not healed. The word in Greek is saved. And that's going to be important as we go along. So just pay attention to that. There's a difference between healed and saved. He wants his daughter to be saved. Jesus goes with Jairus. And now they're moving through along the town as best as they can. But remember, they're in this huge crowd. I mean, this is like trying to get through downtown Great Barrington on a summer afternoon. It is slow going. And in the midst of this crowd is another individual who likewise has heard about Jesus. And she too is desperate for his help. 
Now, we're never given her name, only her problem. And it's a problem that's, while uncomfortable, to talk about. Different translations describe it in different ways, but essentially this woman has been experiencing a perpetual menstrual flow for 12 years. Yeah, I know, we're all kind of squeamish right now, like we don't want to talk about that. But that's what's happening to her. She's been bleeding nonstop for 12 years. Women in the, in the congregation, you know what this talk is talking about. Men, you're just wishing I'd stop talking about it. Which is precisely part of the point of this story. How many times do we have things that we're suffering from that we don't want to talk about? Things that people don't want us to talk about with them. Things that embarrass us that shame us, that isolate us. That's what this woman has been experiencing. She's alone, it appears. It's unusual for a woman to be alone in a crowd like this and then approach and touch an unknown man. So that in itself is a bit astounding. She seems to have had money at one time. It tells us that she spent great deals of money on countless physicians who appear to have taken her money but not helped her. In fact, it says it made it worse. So she's alone. She's now presumably poor. And she's been suffering an embarrassing situation for 12 years. Now, bleeding for 12 years, just to make this clear, especially for men out there, let me make this clear, bleeding for 12 years without modern conveniences and the hygienic products now available, well, quite, quite frankly, being around this woman, there would have been an odor. People would have shunned her. And so, as she presses in to this crowd, there's probably some dirty looks. There's probably some snide comments. There's probably more than a little disgust. And yet she continues to push her way in. She does not petition Jesus the way Jairus has. Unlike the sick child, she has no one, presumably, to advocate on her behalf. She's grown accustomed to being ignored, and yet she knows that this man holds the key to her salvation. Because that's the word that's being used here, unlike what the, the translation we read said. She isn't just looking to be healed. The text says she's looking to be saved. She believes Jesus, just touching his cloak, can save her. Now, some of us might have been wondering, why doesn't she just ask him? I mean, get it over with. If he can make you better, just ask him. Maybe it's her lack of status. Maybe it's the embarrassment of her situation. Maybe it's a fear of rejection. Maybe she doesn't want to bother this busy teacher and healer. They're all viable options. For anyone who suffered for a long time knows those feelings, knows the feelings of hopelessness, knows the feelings of desperation, of having run out of options, of used up resources, of being taken advantage of. And now a miracle is needed. And a miracle is what happens. Because the moment that woman reaches out, she grabs onto Jesus' cloak, just touches that cloak, and instantly she feels in her body the blood has stopped. She is healed. 
Now here, here the word healed in Greek is used. She has not been saved yet. She's been healed. Now, of course, as is so common in so many biblical texts, a bit of a, a comedic encounter ensues because Jesus almost comically stops in the middle of the crowd. He comes to a dead stop, looks about him and says, who touched me? You can almost hear the exasperation in the voices of the disciples as they respond. Don't you see the crowd pressing in on you? You're walking down, you're walking around in Times Square on a Friday night and you're wondering who brushed against you? Come on, look at the crowd. What a ridiculous question Jesus is asking. But he will not be deterred. He stays still and continues to ask the question. He continues to call out. And this woman, she knows. She knows what's happened. And she falls at his feet with fear and trembling and tells him the whole truth. Now, I'll admit, I've preached on this text several times. Seldom have I noticed that phrase, the whole truth. Did you notice that phrase, the whole truth, in the text? I'm fascinated by that. What is the whole truth she recounts to Jesus? Does she tell him the story of those 12 long years of suffering? Does she tell him about all the physicians who took advantage of her and took her money? Does she tell him about the shame and the embarrassment? Does she tell him about the family and friends who stopped coming around out of disgust for her situation? Does she tell him how certain she was of his ability to save her. The whole truth, whatever it was. Now we, particularly as American hearers, we might expect Jesus at this point to let her have it, because that's what most of us would do in America. Our immediately, we would have the response of, Get in line, lady. We all want something from him. Who do you think you are? We all have problems. Don't you see? You're delaying the healing of the child of a very important person. She is stealing a healing. How dare she? She has no right. To this quality health care. Jairus, Jairus, this good, respectable, upstanding leader of the community, is waiting. His daughter is dying, and this woman, this woman is too bold. This woman thinks she has a right to health care. This woman thinks she can just walk right up to some man and take what she needs. This woman thinks she has the right to what Jairus is entitled to. She's stealing a healing. That might, might be what some of us are thinking at this point, but not Jesus. See, because Jesus wasn't conducting an invest investigation with those questions. He wanted to offer an invitation this was an opportunity for the woman not to just be healed of her illness, but to be saved from her isolation, to be reclaimed and restored. She didn't need to steal the healing. She was going to be offered salvation. Jesus responds not with judgment, not with righteous indignation or disgust, Instead, he calls this woman daughter. He claims her as a member of God's family. 
He gives her a place, a family. He restores her status in the community. Your faith has saved you. And that is the word there. She is now saved. Not just healed. She now is saved. Go in peace. Whole, healthy, free of your affliction. And it's then, as Jesus is uttering those words, messengers arrive and declare that G Jairus' daughter is dead. The injustice, the rage, the disgust, the disappointment that must have flowed through Jairus. His daughter was dead. And it was that woman's fault. But Jesus, Jesus merely turns to him and says, Don't be afraid. Have faith. Do you see the irony in the moment? The one whom we presume to have had the right to the healing is the one who needs to have faith. And the one who had faith was the one who's received a healing. It's the woman's faith that saves her, but it's Jairus' fear that threatens the salvation of his daughter. But Jesus continues to Jairus' home. And despite the mocking of the crowds, he goes in and takes the girl by the hand, the girl who is dead, and instructs her to get up. And she stands and walks around, restored to life. And what does Jesus have to say? Feed your child. Much like the epistle reading from this morning, what we come to discover is that there is enough for everyone. Jesus is for all not just the VIPs. The man had the promise of healing, and the woman had the faith. But through this encounter, the woman receives her, feeling and her healing, and the man is brought to greater faith. You see, when we follow the example of Christ, when we let go of greed and grasp faith instead, we come to discover that everyone gets what they need, from Jesus. The kingdom of God means salvation for all. This is the good news, and let the people say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to join in our hymn of response found in the New Century Hymnal number 545, There Was Jesus by the Water.
I invite you to join with me in a spirit of prayer. Eternal God, we all come in need of your salvation. Many of us are suffering from afflictions for which we want healing. But it's only you who can save us. Restore us. Clear from us all of the shame and embarrassment and discomfort of our lives. We pray this day, O oh God, for all who are suffering, whether of body or mind or spirit. We pray especially for Alan, for Sue, for John, and for Julie. We pray for the hundreds who have been injured, killed, or remain missing in the building collapse in Florida. We pray for our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer siblings on this open and affirming Sunday that they may know of your salvation, that they may be freed from any sense of shame or embarrassment and know that you welcome them into your family without question, without reserve. We pray for all of this, O oh God, in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 386 in the New Century Hymnal, The Church's One Foundation.
following the post salute, we invite you to join us in the courtyard for some uh, cookies and punch and a story. Today's story is You Are Special by Max Lucado. And now for the benediction. Siblings in Christ, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. But strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen.